So hi everybody. So uh, we just heard how practical IPv6 can be. So my speech is uh, regarding network telemetry and big data. And uh, today I want to show you basically how big data can make a difference in your network. So before going into what actually network telemetry is, I want to bring you in a little bit more into the movie where we are right now at Swisscom. Uh, if you look at, let's see here, that little picture below here, that's what's happening in most service providers' networks that you actually have network devices which don't know the whole network, basically putting out alerts and want to get your attention. And you as an operator or a piece of software has to figure out how all these alerts are related to each other. And take, that takes a lot of your time and is very inefficient. And we believe that the future goes more into a direction like this, where you have a piece of software which gets basically metrics from your network pushed and the piece of software looks at this metric and tells you, I think there is something going wrong. There you should put your attention in and do something. And the big difference is then you don't need so many screens anymore. Oops. You just have one person or one screen. So you, you, you get much more efficiency out. And also the, another thing is that if you collect lots of data from your network, it might be for a human that it's not really understandable, but actually this data comes from the network and the network is using actually such kind of data to forward the traffic. So this data makes actually sense to, to machines, to software, and what we actually need is something which then makes it presentable to humans. That's what I want to talk about. So if you look how a network is actually working and what kind of metrics you can collect from your network, you end up like in three different areas. One is basically the forwarding plane where you actually forward your IP packets. There you see how your network is being used. Then on the right side, you have basically the, the topology, which is like the physics of your network. So these IP pack packets actually traveling through interfaces and routers throughout your network. And on the very left-hand side, you have the control plane. That's where you actually provision your network, where you add new prefixes, where you add new VLANs, VXLANs, and so on. And there, you actually also steer the traffic. So those are connected, correlated to each other. So depending on where you're actually working in your company and what you're doing on your network, you're interested if I take a router out of service, what's happening with the IP packets? Are, still, are they still okay? Are they still forwarded? Did my control plane really shift to my redundant router on the other side? So depending what you're changing on the network, you actually always want to look at the different angle from your data. And if the data is correlated, you know basically if I change that, you know on the other angle what you actually have, uh, what kind of uh, impact. And ITF is really working on uh, bringing these metrics out of your network. This is just an example of a few uh, collection methods, protocols to get these metrics out of the network. For instance, IPFIX is well standardized. It exists already since I think over 10 years, uh, you get it probably in all the, your routers you have in your networks, where on the very right hand side, gRPC, GNMI is something newer, you need newer software, maybe two or three year old maximum. And on the very left hand side is BMP, BGP monitoring protocol. This is also very well established. And having these protocols there, able to collect, push the data from the network into your big data lake, then you can actually make sense out of it. Of course, if you get lots of data, you need a system how to process this data. So from top to down, you have the network, 
you have a data collection layer. And the data collection layer is actually just like transforming the schema. Because nowadays, we still have the IT world and the network world. And they speak to two different languages. So now we have to convert the language, the schema, to make sure that when the data arrives in a data lake, that we don't lose its meaning. The message broker is just there to make sure that all the data we receive, we can aggregate together and buffer it if needed, and then process it, enrich it, and then at the end, import it in data storage and make it available to analytics. And the long-term vision at the end, like every manager wants at the end, is that we can actually automatically drive our, our network. So for instance, if you have a bundle interface with lots of physical interfaces, that you find out that one of your data interfaces is start dropping traffic, you might want to take this interface out of the bundle. But before you take it out of the bundle, you want to know what happens if I do that. Are the remaining interfaces able to carry the traffic? And if yes, if you perform it, is the result actually what you predicted before? And once you achieve that, you know you did a safe, um, safe action on your network, and that can be automated. So from a data modeling perspective, if you look at the, at the VPN network, in this case like MPLS, uh, if you start collecting forwarding metrics, um, you have a lots of private IP addresses. And problems about private IP addresses is they aren't unique. So by not correlating it to your control plane, like BGP, uh, these forwarding plane metrics doesn't make much sense. By correlating it to BGP, you make them unique. In a BGP network, uh, in MPLS, for instance, the BGP route distinguisher makes it unique. If you're using VXLAN or VLAN, it's actually the VLAN ID or the VXLAN VNI ID who makes it unique. So by correlating BGP information and the forwarding plane information through IPFIX, we can make actually sense out of this data, even in a VPN environment. And the classical VPN, for instance, uh, you have, we call it a so-called logical connection, like the VPN in between. You have a connection point where you're attached to the VPN, and another one here. And by attaching to all the networks the proper community values, BGP community values, you can actually use these community values then and searching for these forwarding plane metrics within the network. So then, thanks to BGP, thanks to communities, you're making actually the forwarding plane accessible on your network. And that looks a little bit like this. So if you forward traffic, you have a source IP address, a destination IP address, a source port, destination port, and so on. And then when you correlate it, you have communities, route distinguishers, and route targets. And on the other hand, you have devices and the interfaces who forward the traffic. And we call them dimensions. And de depending from which dimension you start the query, you can see the other dimensions on the other side. So at the end, when we are injecting the data into the data lake, I mark them in three different colors, yellow, blue, uh, depending from where the, the actually the, the, the information is coming from. So blue means forwarding plane, yellow means the control plane, and green just what the data collection just add for troubleshooting purposes. The same thing works also for network address translation, if you still have to rely on IPv4. So here, network address translation has one big challenge, that IP addresses can change. So before not and after not, there can be difference. But if you are in a VPN network and have a VPN identifier, 
you can actually use the VPN identifier to select the IP traffic regardless before or after the NOT. And you see actually where it travels throughout the network. At the end, looks very really similar like before. The blue part is the IP fix part. The yellow part is the BGP part. Now, VPNs can be VXLAN. Same thing. Not much of a difference. So the right side IP addresses remain. Routers remain. What's different here is we have no longer BGP attributes. We have the, the VXLAN VN ID, we have the, the VLAN ID, source destination MAC, since it's a layer 2 tunnel. So basically, just the dimension, the VXLAN dimension is changing. And at the end, same thing, the, the blue one is the IP fix, the forwarding plane, the yellow one is basically what's coming from VXLAN. The last thing which I showed you uh, regarding VXLAN, uh, we, had, we worked closely with Huawei together to bring it on our next generation broadband network. So we have the possibility to use this VXLAN dimensions to query the, the forwarding plane matrix. Now, this was lots of theory. So the best thing is to show it in, in a demo. So let's dive into the big data lake and see what we can get out of it. I will start with something very simple. You probably are most used to it that you're actually looking at the device level. Basically, you're looking at which router is actually producing the, traf uh, the, the matrix to you. So here I just said in with these two routers from a, from a platform providing us metrics. Now the next thing I'm asking here is I want to understand what VPNs right now having carrying traffic on this platform. And I see five so-called BGP route targets, or uh, six, now five. <laughs> and now I want to understand which routers in this network are actually participating on these five VPNs. So the only thing I'm doing here is I mark these five VPNs, use it as an identifier, remove the platform here, and put the platform in here. And with one go, I see lists of routers which are actually contributing to this VPN. So now the next thing is, I mean, I can see, I can check how much traffic do I have overall over these VPNs across all these routers. And this is the sum of the traffic. And that's the real cool thing about it is I don't select any router in here. If you think you're provisioning additional networks, additional service on your network, most of the people are just concerned, this is the service. Show me how much traffic, what kind of traffic I have on this service. And this is the simple query to it. Probably the next thing you want to know is, is the traffic actually forwarded or dropped? And you can do that by just adding one dimension. 
the so-called forwarding status, where the router tells you what's the reason. And at the moment, we just have the reason codes, which is, for instance, the 64 means forwarded. The other co uh, codes means dropped or consumed. And if you are now interested and say, now we don't want to see all the traffic, we only want to see the drop traffic, you can just easily exclude it and say, we don't want to see the 64. We are interested in the rest. And now, as you see, with just a bunch of clicks, I dive into lots of data from lots of different routers. I find myself very quickly where these VPNs are connected. I understand how much traffic I have on these VPNs. I know how much I'm dropping. That's how I can navigate in this data. And this by using all these, these three different angles from device over control plane to forwarding plane. Now, another thing which I can show you is, oh, let me switch here. For instance, VXLAN. Here, uh, I have a bit of problem that I mustn't scroll down too much. Let me make the window a bit smaller. Then you can see everything. Actually, you don't see the whole screen, but in this query, you basically see uh, on the left-hand side here the uh, that doesn't work here. <laughs> you see basically the the, the so-called VNI, the service VLAN, so the service we actually provide to the customer, and on the right-hand side you see the IP connection metric, the source and destination IP address, which is happening now in this VPN. And we can start using this as filter and say, OK, within this VPN, this single IP address here, that's the one which I'm interested in. There, I don't understand what's going on. And I'm still in the VPN. I'm still seeing which devices are involved in the forwarding path. And I can see, based on this IP address, what kind of traffic currently is going on. Another thing which I showed before was the NOT translation. Like we have from this IP address, we ping to this IP address. After the translation, this is the translate, whoops, this is the translation table. And further down, we see actually after the translation how the packet transforms. So we get both information at the same time, the translation table and the forwarding table. And the key point here is also we're using the service identifier. So, I mean, you don't want to search netted traffic by using IP addresses because these IP addresses are changed. So you need something else, another dimension, to actually query the database to get the end-to-end -end VPN across the, v uh, across the network address translation. OK, that was my part. I'm handing over to uh, Zongren. Maybe we can go back to the slide. Thank you, Thomas. So good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm basically the IT guy Thomas mentioned, <laughs> and he's a network guy. <laughs> and today I will just uh, give you a bit of uh, um, not this one. Okay. information about uh, our learnings and takeaways by applying big data and the machine learning technologies in the network uh, streaming telemetry. And uh, specifically, the talk will be mostly focusing on the anomaly detection and uh, monitoring all the different metrics and the KPIs we have collected. 
So basically, I'm coming from the time series analytics platform team. And uh, in our team, the goal is to provide uh, some generic service that's being able to let uh, all the different users, like Thomas, bring in all the different data and uh, put it in our platform. And uh, he can get a very easy self-service UI like uh, he just uh, demoed you. Basically, that is the part you see here on the left from the metabase. And uh, the user can very easily slice and dice into the data and uh, do the ad hoc analysis. But uh, this will be not enough because when we're talking about the metrics and KPIs and uh, all the different things you would like to monitor, this could be tens of thousands or like hundreds of thousands. And you cannot uh, just looking at the dashboard every day and uh, putting like tens of thousands of uh, engineers and uh, trying to check which KPI if it's correct or not. That's why like uh, on top of the platform, we're also developing a anomaly detection engine that is able to look at all these different time series automatically and being able to analyze and model the time series based on the historical data we have and alert you accordingly when something looks fishy or seems like it's anomaly happening. That is the part uh, on the right you see here. And uh, this is basically the anomaly detection engine. So this is like everything about the platform. It looks like very easy, but uh, when you look at the numbers, it's uh, totally different. For example, like uh, the demo Thomas just showed you with a query for four hours, in my estimation, it would be a few hundred million rows of events. So our platform in just a few billion events per day, and uh, this event gets into our cluster. For the moment, we have a cluster running in the OLAP engine around the, um, 20 nodes, and this is going to grow. And uh, we are talking about uh, terabytes of uh, events, of course. So this is definitely very challenging. And what's more challenging here is uh, we should be able to generate uh, all the different time series from the, all the data we have. And the time series is not, let's say, like on the tens of, uh, maybe tens to hundreds scale, but it's going to grow into thousands of uh, hundreds of thousands. In that sense, if we need to monitor all these different time series, we need to have something automated and uh, maybe leveraging all the machine learning models to do that automatically. So now they come to the question, why are we doing this? Why are we not uh, using the threshold model? If we just put a simple threshold model on uh, all the time series, and then we should be able to scale this uh, quite easily. But the problem is, if we consider this uh, time series graph on the top, consider this is something like uh, the number of uh, packets or some bytes Thomas just uh, queried. And this is actually kind of a few billion or a few, uh, few million events. And if you apply the threshold model, you could probably capture all these different uh, peaks, but this is not exactly what you want. And when there's something small, like a very minor spike happening here, it could be still very interesting because we are talking about uh, very highly aggregated data. And uh, this could be maybe uh, one area of all the network device in Switzerland. It's still a big impact. So that means like we need to really leverage in more sophisticated models to take into account different uh, factors of the time series. In this case, we need to say like, uh, probably this could be something like a fishy during the night and there's so many traffic. And uh, if you just use a threshold model, this would be detected. So basically, this is the challenge part from the modeling side. And if we just room out of the picture, so the modeling side is uh, kind of simple because if as a data scientist or software engineer, you could probably already do this with a notebook. But if we room out like uh, the, just the modeling in the notebook, if we take this in the big picture, we see like uh, there's a lot of challenging around the whole context. The most basic one is uh, how do we do it uh, in real time? Like uh, this is already like uh, this is already what I mentioned earlier. So we are talking about ingesting a few billion events per day. If we need to do it in real time, that means our system should be able to eat this amount of events and being able to also to provide the faster queries like uh, Thomas did, like uh, not some of bytes uh, per five minutes for the past four hours. So that is the first challenge we are facing here to be able to provide a real-time system. And second part is uh, really about the data quality and uh, the delays. So I think this is a very typical issue when we are talking about big data and machine learning. So if you are given a purely clean data set, uh, then everybody can definitely apply all the different models you can get online. 
and uh, played in the notebook, but uh, when it's come to production, it's definitely different. For example, with all the streaming, tele uh, streaming telemetry data we have, there's probably several different teams working on the upper stream part. And uh, for example, if there's something happening with the data pipeline, uh, maybe there's uh, some delay of the data, or maybe there's uh, some uh, uh, connector doesn't work as expectedly, how should we deal with the latest data point? Should we alert it? Should we take it? Or should we just ignore it? So it's not a trivial task because if you just uh, send, a, a, for example, an alerting email with this uh, latest data point, it could be it's a false alarm and this will harm like the credibility of your platform. And if you just ignore it, so if it's, what if it's really something happening? So basically that means we need to really try to handle the data quality issue as a platform also not just saying like uh, if you give us data, we do it. If you don't give us data, we just ignore. This wouldn't work. The third part is uh, more about uh, the machine learning challenges. Like in time series or in the network world, as a data scientist engineer, I rarely see these labels. The labels mean like uh, if I see a anomaly in the time series, do I know if it's a real one or not? Most of the time, I don't know. That's like a Bring us, bring in, that, that brings in us a huge challenge, which means we have to apply our model in an unsupervised learning way. And uh, this is very difficult because if we want to improve the, the accuracy of our model to really just send the, the good alerts, not the false alarms, we need to get some insights from the network engineers, from the user to confirm that. And this is a very challenging task. And uh, there's a few ways to solve it. For example, you can establish some channeling with a final user who will receive your alerts and get some feedback from them, and slowly you are going to build some label data set and that can help you to improve your model. And also you can do it in a more like a passive way. You can embed uh, all the different analytics service into your email, into your web interface to get some sense from like the user's perspective if the anomaly is a real one or not, and what's his feeling, and uh, slowly like combining all the different insights you get from the user with the analytics, with the direct feedback, you could have a growing a label data set. And with this label data set, you can really try to uh, improve your model, your accuracy, and this can really help the, the final alerts. And the last part is uh, about uh, the model selection and model auto-tuning. Since like we're talking about uh, not only five to 10 time series, but we are talking about uh, hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands time series. It's basically not possible to tune the time series models ourselves because you cannot just sit in there every day waiting for us to give me <laughs> another time series and I tune it and give it back to him. It's too many and we cannot do it. So the challenge here is also to be able to automatically tune the time series to select the, the right model to apply the different uh, threshold to the models that being able to deliver a relatively good uh, model to the final user. And uh, this is a traditional topic in machine learning, how to avoid overfitting and how to, how to not to be too generalized and uh, making all the data points to say is good. So this is a big topic here. I'm just uh, listing all different challenges here, but uh, each of them will cost us uh, quite a lot of energy to solve them. And the last part is after we detect an anomaly, what do we do? So if I say, like, if I just detect something with the network traffic and I give this uh, to Thomas, probably he can just use uh, the metabase like uh, he did in the demo <coughs> to find out what happened. But uh, there's uh, so many different like, uh, network engineers and also so many different use cases. It's probably not uh, every, everyone would like to spend a huge amount of time to do this work. So the idea is, uh, the best case would be when we detect any, anything, like anything looks like an anomaly or fish, we try to give some like uh, insights about what could be the root causes. And this information will be very helpful because uh, as a network engineer, for example, I can directly see from the potential root causes that uh, this kind of uh, information already valuable that I don't need to manually try to drill down into all these different dimensions. And I put a slight like, uh, chunk of a uh, uh, piece of data here, but uh, in the real world, this uh, chunk of data could be, let's say, like a few hundred million rows. Basically, it's not uh, very easy if you just want to do this process manually to go through each of the dimension to see, like, where, where is the 
which cell tower is causing mostly of the field cost, or like uh, which firmware actually is causing this. One issue is we have so many dimensions, which is uh, the different angles to look at the data. But the second issue is also like uh, each of the dimension could uh, have a very high cardinality. Here, for example, I just made a uh, like artificial made a firmware version to like uh, uh, around the 60,000, but uh, the dimension, the cardinality of dimension could be even more than that. And it's basically very difficult to do this process manually. So the idea is uh, when we detect the, the anomaly, we should be able to also deliver already uh, some good first-hand insights that uh, allows the people receive alerts, subscribe to alerts, being able to quickly react and uh, help their analysis and the reaction process. So I talk about all the different aspects and the challenges around the whole, talk, talk, uh, the whole topic, but uh, how do we do this together? So this is uh, like all the building blocks we have. So on the left, you see all the different uh, streaming data coming to our platform. And uh, this could be all the different events on the network. This could be all the different KPIs, like uh, uh, the quality of the calls and uh, the user experience, etc. And all of them, we are going to stream into our platform. And there, we are trying to generate all the different time series. So you will see the data source client. We will get. Uh, So from the data source client, we can generate all the different time series and we'll put it into our anomaly detection engine. And the engine will start in all the process I mentioned earlier to build, to, to find the good model and to automatically tune the model. And uh, when this is ready, we can continue with the next process. For example, let's say like a best case is there's no anomaly at all, but uh, if there is some anomaly, we should be able to trigger in the subsequent process, which is the root causes and uh, the ticket enrichment. The idea is, uh, for example, if there's uh, something happened with the uh, network telemetry, we can see if there's any planned changes on the network, and this information will be integrated to the alerts, and also we would perform the root cause analysis process to check what could be the causes for the changes. Is this, uh, if in the field cause uh, example, if it's because coming from one cell tower, or is it because uh, another different firmware chain firmware version causing this. And finally, we have all the building blocks to, to deliver this insight to the final user. So this is more like uh, from the landscape perspective to see the whole process. But uh, in order to continuously improve, improve our model, improve our alerting and the detection, we have all the process here, like you see, regarding the analytic service and web app. Basically, what we do is uh, we use uh, the analytic service to try to infer the user's idea or user's opinion of uh, the alert uh, about the anomaly. And from this, we can really stream it back to our models. So slowly, we can get a better and better understanding of what the user thinks the anomaly is. And uh, in this way, we kind of get uh, the knowledge or the, also the bias from the final user or the network engineer into our model. And this can eventually help us to reduce the number of false alarms and provide more accurate prediction or anomaly detection. On the bottom, you see like uh, the whole application layer. So we are not only delivering these insights into like uh, just the uh, human readable format, but uh, we have a lot of interface with other system. So some system are actually directly ingesting alerts from our APIs and uh, triggering some process automatically. So in the longer term or in the future, it could be the cases like uh, when we are reaching a very good level of uh, the confidence or uh, accuracy, we can directly trigger in the recovery process or like a debugging process, and uh, this process will be even like a human intervention flow. So that's probably it, and uh, that's all my takeaway. We're not probably like really de-integrating de Einstein, but uh, that's the kind of the feeling. Of course, like uh, all of this, we are actually building all the big data framework and application and machine learning models because we have all the data. So I will hand over this to Paolo to let him explain a bit more about the collection side. Oh, 10 minutes left, okay. 
10 minutes left, so it means uh, uh, I have more slides than minutes, so this will be brutal. Um, so first of all, I'm very honored to be uh, presenting again at uh, um, uh, Zwinog after 10 years. Um, after 10 years, now I have a picture. I embraced uh, with full hands, uh, you know, social networks, so I have a LinkedIn, uh, and uh, GitHub exists, right? Um, I am Paul, I'm the creator of uh, PMSCCT, and uh, why I am speaking about PMSCCT is because it's part of the collection layer of uh, what uh, uh, Thomas and Zongren have been uh, uh, presenting so far. And uh, you may recognize, you know, from Thomas' presentation, you know, the octopus logo, it was in the, uh, the angry octopus logo, why angry the octopus, because nobody knows how to pr pronounce uh, PMSCCT. So it's uh, after uh, after a drink, I already lost everything. Uh, everybody, you know, in trying to um, spell it. So still, uh, uh, let's say uh, after ten years, like PMCT has got a logo, and uh, I had a very similar slide uh, ten years ago. And uh, you, what you can see in uh, as a difference is that there is more data sources. So we have, for example, here uh, streaming telemetry, and uh, we have m many more backends supported here, right? So uh, relational databases and the uh, fl flat files and the others, they were already there. But for example, now you have brokers, right? For uh, RabbitMQ and Kafka. And then you can correlate against uh, many other data sources uh, like uh, 10 years ago, it was just BGP. Now you have BMP, IGP, GYP, and other stuff, right? So uh, the, if you want to have a throwback to the 90s, you can go to pmscct.net. But the code is also hosted on GitHub, and I trade hugs for likes, right? So if you, you know, can take, if you have a GitHub account, please consider going there and you know, be eligible for a hug. Uh, so what is the use case for uh, 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 message brokers like Kafka and RabbitMQ? And why I only speak about uh, message brokers and not uh, uh, like uh, Druid, for example, right? Uh, Druid or Elasticsearch and things like that, which are maybe more recognizable names. It's because, uh, you know, there has been a time where there were only a few relational databases, and then, uh, like, uh, there has been a, a time where, you know, um, every year a new database was introduced, maybe more than one per year, and then there was a hype. I don't know, there was the moment, the, there was the hype of uh, MongoDB, the moment of the hype of Elasticsearch and things like that. And then, uh, mm, you know, as a developer, you cannot track all of this down, right? So you cannot really track the flourishing of a lot of bright minds in the industry. So what you do is essentially you choose a message broker, you deliver everything at the message broker. Uh, I am. A myself a very fan of Kafka. And then all of these databases, they have a Kafka consumer, so they can consume data from there. And you know, it, the game is done, essentially. And the, when there will be a new database, it will be automatically, let's say, supported. Uh, what is uh, very specific about uh, big data, why uh, I like it very much, is because uh, many years ago, when you had uh, relational databases, like you put data in a relational database, and then what? Whereas the big data people uh, really realized that, that you have to have a stack and you have to be able to very simply uh, be able to visualize data. So you have the Elk stack, you have the Peak stack, you have uh, Apache Druid and Apache Superset uh, and <coughs> things like that. So in other words, it's very easy now to put data into you know, a big data system and then it's very uh, easy to query and to visualize it, right? Which is a huge step forward. So finally, I can get rid of the question that uh, Freddie was asking me for years, like when do you build a UI for PMSCT? I don't need a UI for PMSCT, right? <laughs> right. Um, this is, uh, you know, just a, a slide to tell you that, uh, you know, PMSCT is very uh, versatile, it's very flexible and things like that. So every different industry has a use case uh, for it, uh, every corner of our industry, I mean. Uh, of course, that comes with the trade-off uh, that, uh, you know, a little bit steep uh, learning curve. But uh, here is where I trade, you know, knowledge for beers. Like, you give me a beer and I give you knowledge, so that's, uh, that's great. Um, a few technical facts about uh, PMSCCT. It's like, uh, okay, 
uh, I think I, I hope I made it clear that uh, it's easy to add uh, you know new backends uh, support for new backends and also for new data sources. Of course, all of these data sources can be you know correlated with with each other. Like you can correlate flows with the you know with the uh, BGP with IGP uh, with streaming telemetry and things like that. Uh, PMSCCT has also a wide variety of, uh, you know, uh, data aggregation, uh, sorry, of uh, reduction techniques available because, you know, networks, you know, vomit uh, a, a more uh, um, enormous amount of data on the collector. So you must reduce this somehow. So you have a spatial uh, aggregation, temporal aggregation, filtering, sampling, subsampling, and things like that. Um, you can build uh, multiple views how out of the same collected traffic, like you collect traffic once, for example, or BGP once and things like that, and you can use it the, the way you like. So you can correlate things together, but you can also choose in the, to have the value added later in the pipeline, right? So you are not, uh, so you are correlating it in some uh, specific way and not let PMSCCT do it, right? So uh, for that, you can stream, uh, you know, data real time or you can dump at regular time intervals, or both, you can actually have both strategies, right? Very handy for, for example, for BGP. You dump a BGP table every 30 minutes, and then you do deltas after that, and then add another snapshot, and then all the deltas after that, and things like that. Um, I wanted, so in, let's say, I'm already approaching the second part of the presentation, let's say, in which uh, I, speak specifically about the streaming telemetry. Why? Because this is a, um, a work that we have been doing together with Thomas uh, and uh, Matthias. Uh, Matthias, please, yeah, stand up. He is Matthias. He coded a lot of uh, the stuff that I'm going to speak about. Um, so streaming telemetry, like you have uh, um, with capital S and capital T, you have a lot of metaphysics descriptions, uh, but in, let's say, in a, in a very, very summary, like it's a push technology. So you, if you imagine, uh, you know, by contrast, uh, SNMP is a, a pull technology, so you pull for data and you get the data. And uh, being a push technology, you can achieve much more scalability. And you can subscribe to data of interest, right? So you can say what you are interested into, you can configure it somehow, Three minutes left. Uh, so somehow, uh, and uh, uh, let's say uh, you get the data you want. Um, you may have heard, uh, you know, uh, presentations from Google around it, like uh, with a cinematic title like SNMP is dead. And you know, if you have two feet in reality, you know how disagreeable this statement is. But uh, it is true that uh, streaming telemetry is uh, coming up, right? And uh, from a standardization perspective, it's uh, at the current moment in a kind of a magma state in the sense that whichever side you look at streaming telemetry, like uh, the transport layer, the encoding layer, the models, you have essentially a huge matrix of possibilities, right? And uh, so meaning that uh, standardization is, uh, you know, still in process, right? What is going to be the outcome? I don't know. Uh, probably there will be a standard or uh, the, as a very wise man said once, you know, the beauty of standardization, you have multiple standards to pick from, right? So uh, what is the mission statement of PMSCCT in, uh, uh, in the context of streaming telemetry? Essentially two. So one is integrate streaming telemetry with other data sources, like I said before. And uh, let's say in this magma state, you know, in which standardization is going on and things like that, offer to people a free, open, uh, multi-vendor platform. If you uh, played with streaming telemetry, probably you played with, uh, I don't know, Open NTI from Juniper or from Cisco Pipeline and things like that. And then guess what? You have a multi-vendor network and one of these products doesn't work for the other vendors you have in your network. So the mission statement there is to have something a little bit more multi-vendor. To visualize it, like uh, you have this, uh, you know, PM telemetry D uh, demo. And now, thanks to Matthias, we have a PM gRPCD to keep up, uh, you know, to keep up uh, gRPC sessions as well. So um, you can do what you can do with all the daemons, like a PMSCCT daemon, you receive streaming telemetry, then for example, you can dump it to flat files or to a Kafka broker, 
or more interestingly, you can correlate, for example, with NetFlow, right? So you have flow data, you correlate it with streaming telemetry, and you write it out to whatever backend. In this, uh, this use case is very interesting because w actually, what is the use case behind it? So uh, let's make a very simple example. Whoever has ever played with the NetFlow knows that uh, NetFlow is uh, typically a sample technology on uh, high-speed networks, uh, modern high-speed networks. Uh, sampling uh, drives to uh, under counting, right? So there is an accuracy there. And the streaming telemetry, you can get, for example, the, uh, let's say, uh, the equivalent of interface counters, the equivalent uh, that you would get with the SNMP. And uh, essentially, what you can do is that you can use this uh, uh, coarse grained, uh, you know, information, like uh, as a golden standard, like, so you can use uh, the equivalent, so the equivalent of so the interface counters that you get through streaming telemetry as a way to rescale, you know, the uh, NetFlow data, right? So you compute how much uh, how much NetFlow you have per interface, for example. Then you can uh, uh, compute a rescaling value, and then you can rescale the NetFlow against the interface counters, and you receive them through streaming telemetry instead of uh, SNMP. And uh, you know, being to push technologies, flows, and streaming telemetry. Uh, like also BMP, I mean, it's a very fantastic alignment for correlation. And my concluding slide is uh, uh, this, that you have already seen in Thomas' slides, so it's a little bit like a circling back, like what is the role of PMSCCT in what, uh, you know, we are describing is uh, this one, right? So the Angry Octopus logo, the data collection, and uh, that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>